Bitcoin Decrypted, Part 2, Technical Aspects. In Part 1, I placed Bitcoin in a larger historical context and offered some perspectives, including Clark's Third Law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. We next shift the focus toward the technical elements that make the seeming magic of Bitcoin possible in the real world. Clark's Second Law states that, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Bitcoin uses several major streams of technology and method, each of which is quite recent in historical perspective. An open source free software model, peer-to-peer -peer networking, digital signatures, and hashing algorithms. The very first developments in each of these areas occurred in the 1970s through the 1990s. Bitcoin combines some of the best later developments in each area to make new things possible on top of them. Since few people understand any of these basic components, understanding an innovation that combines a number of them in new and surprising ways is, of course, challenging without some study. It may help to look at how each part contributes to Bitcoin's central function, creating and maintaining a single unforgeable record that shows the assignment of every Bitcoin unit to addresses. This record is structured in the form of a linked chain of blocks of transactions. The Bitcoin network, protocol, and all of its parts maintain and update this blockchain in a way that anyone can verify. Bitcoin revises the Russian proverb doveryai, no proveryai, trust but verify, to just verify. If a single word could describe what the Bitcoin network does, it would be verification. For a borderless global currency, relying on trust would be the ultimate bad idea. Previous monetary systems have all let users down just where they had little alternative but to rely on some trusted third party. First, the core Bitcoin software is open source and free. Anyone can use it, examine it, propose changes, or start a new branch under a different name. The open source approach can be especially good for security because more sets of eyes are more likely to find weaknesses and see improvement paths. Open source also tends to promote a natural order meritocracy. Contributors who tend to display the best judgment also tend to have more of their contributions reflected over time. Unending forum discussions and controversies are a feature rather than a bug. They focus attention on problems, both real and imagined, which helps assure that whatever is implemented has been looked at and tested from a great number of different angles. Many computers all over the world run core Bitcoin software that implements the Bitcoin protocol. A protocol is something roughly like a spoken language. Participants must speak that language and not some other, and they must speak it well enough to get their message across and to understand others. New protocols can be made up, but just as with making up new languages, it is usually not very productive. Such things only take off and become useful if enough others see some advantage in actually joining in. Second, as a peer-to-peer -peer network, there is no center. Anyone can download the core Bitcoin software and start a new node. This node will discover and start communicating with some other nodes or peers. No node has any special authority or position relative to any other. Each connects with at least eight peers, but sometimes many more. Some faster and always-on nodes relay more information and have more connections, but this conveys no special status. Any node can connect or drop out any time and join again later. Note that one does not have to run a full node just to use Bitcoin for ordinary purposes. With all this openness and freedom, some people worry that other cryptocurrencies could just be introduced one after the other and that these could substitute for Bitcoin and undermine its position and value over time in a competitive process. However, other cryptocurrencies already have been introduced one after another. They are collectively known as altcoins. There are a very large number of them already. So what has happened so far? 
Well, people mine them and trade them, but none has gained much traction in being used for the purchase of goods and services. The leader, called Litecoin, is sometimes accepted where Bitcoin is also accepted. The actual use of a cryptocurrency to pay for goods and services requires the buildup of network effects. For an altcoin to gain much market share relative to Bitcoin, it would have to overcome Bitcoin's existing lock-in and first-mover advantages. To do so, I think market actors, that is users, would have to recognize it as being far superior to Bitcoin in some other ways. This means superior based on users' own understandings of their purposes and priorities, not an engineer's particular idea of superior. Litecoin advocates often use the image of parallel markets for the precious metals, silver and gold. Next to this image, it may also be useful to consider the history of competing technology standards. In this sense, taking over real-world market share next to Bitcoin might be similar to trying to sell keyboards featuring the Dvorak simplified layout rather than the QWERTY layout. Some other arrangements might actually be better from some particular point of view, and some people actually do use Dvorak keyboards. Yet for all its drawbacks, QWERTY continues to dominate 140 years after its initial design. Moreover, while a few people have heard of Dvorak as an alternative keyboard, Fewer have probably considered the astronomical number of other possible keyboard layouts that could be created to compete next to QWERTY, which could happen any time. It's common to say that Bitcoin is decentralized or doesn't have a center, but then where is it? No one knows how many active peering nodes there are, but one daily estimate has been coming up with between 100,000 and 200,000 on any given day. In this example, the estimate detected nearly 160,000 Bitcoin nodes in 188 different countries. 67% of active nodes that day were in the top 10 countries, with 33% in the other 178. The U.S. led, followed by China, the Russian Federation, and Germany. The top 10 ranks look different in per capita terms, here, the Netherlands was first, followed by Canada, Australia, the UK, the US, and Germany. Some nodes also join the process of adding new blocks to the chain, which is called mining. Mining secures the final verification of transactions and assigns first possession of new bitcoins to participating nodes as a reward. All of this relies on two different types of cryptography that few people understand. Both are counterintuitive in what they make possible, so I will focus on giving a sense of each one. When most people hear cryptography, they think of keeping data private and secure through encryption. File encryption can be used to help secure individual Bitcoin wallet files, as it can be used for the password protection of any other files. This is called symmetric key cryptography, which means the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt. Encryption may also be used for communication among users about transactions, as with any other kind of secure traffic. This is called asymmetric key cryptography, which means a public key encrypts a message and its matching private key decrypts it at the other end. However, all of this is peripheral. Nothing inside the core Bitcoin protocol and network is encrypted. Instead, two quite different types of cryptography are used. They are not for keeping secrets, but for making sure the truth is being told. Bitcoin is a robust global system of truth verification. It is, in this sense, the opposite of the memory hole from George Orwell's 1984. It is a remembering chain. The first type of cryptography within Bitcoin is used to create a message digest, or informally, a hash. Bitcoin uses hashing at many different levels. The second type is used to create and verify digital signatures. This uses pairs of signing keys and verification keys. Now we can see what really is in a Bitcoin wallet. Bitcoin wallets do not contain any Bitcoins. Wallets only contain pairs of keys and addresses. 
while its software searches the blockchain for references to the addresses it contains and uses all the related transaction history there to arrive at a live balance to show the user. The seemingly magical things I described in part one that one can do with Bitcoin result from the fact that the user only deals with keys while the actual Bitcoin units exist within the blockchain record itself, not in wallets. Still, the effective possession of the coins, that is, the ability to make use of them, stays with whoever has the signing keys. Where in part one we had images of indestructible locked piggy banks containing bitcoins, we can now understand that wallets only contain pairs of keys and addresses that enable digital signatures and verifications. This is a real example. It starts with a signing key. From this, a unique verification key is generated, which is then hashed into a public address. A blockchain search for this address showed it as unused. It should stay that way because I have just made the signing key public and therefore insecure. This address has been sacrificed for the cause of Bitcoin education. Hashing plays a role quite different from digital signatures. It proves that a message has not been altered. Running a hash of the same message always produces the same result. If a hash does not match a previous one, it is a warning that the current version of the message does not match the original version. Here is a message from Murray Rothbard. He wrote in Man, Economy, and State that it must be reiterated here that value scales do not exist in a void apart from the concrete choices of action. And here is the SHA 256 digest of this message and attribution. This is the same algorithm that Bitcoin uses. Any message of any kind can go into a hash function. The algorithm breaks it down, mixes the parts, and otherwise digests it until it produces a fixed length result called a digest. There are some critical properties of a good hash algorithm. First, the same message always produces the same digest. Second, it's one way. Nothing about the message can be reconstructed from the digest. Even the tiniest change produces a completely different digest with no relationship between the change in input and the change in output. This is called the avalanche effect. Third, the chances of producing the same digest from an altered message are unimaginably small. This is called collision resistance. It is impossible to craft an altered message that produces the same digest as the original unaltered message did. For example, here is the same quote with the two quotation marks omitted. The digest has changed completely and has no relationship to the previous one. A digest gives a yes or no answer to one question. Is the message still exactly the same as it was? In Bitcoin, hashing is used to make it impossible to alter transactions and records. Once the hashes are hashed together within the blockchain, forgery anywhere is impossible. Wallet software is used to create transactions. These include the amount to be sent, sending and receiving addresses, and some other information, which is all hashed together. This hash is signed with any required signing keys to create a unique digital signature valid only for this transaction and no other. All of this is broadcast to the network as unencrypted public information. What makes this possible is that the signature and the verification key do not reveal the signing key. To keep someone from trying to spend the same unit twice and commit a kind of fraud called double spending, nodes check new transactions against the blockchain and against other new transactions to make sure the same units are not being referenced more than once. Each miner collects valid new transactions and incorporates them into a candidate in the competition to publish the next recognized block on the chain. Each miner hashes together a new collection of transactions. This produces a single hash that makes the records of every other transaction interdependent. Each root hash of the transactions in any candidate block differs from every other candidate block 
not least because the miner includes his own unique mining address, so that he can collect the rewards if his candidate block does happen to become recognized as the next one in the chain. Whose candidate block becomes the winner? For the competing miners to recognize a block as the next valid one, the winning miner has to generate a certain hash of his candidate block's header that meets a stringent condition. All of the other miners can immediately check this answer and recognize it as being correct or not. However, even though it is a correct solution, it works only for the miner who found it for his own block. No one else can just take another's correct answer and use it to promote his own candidate block as the real winner instead. This is why the correct answer can be freely published without being misappropriated by others. This unique qualifying hash is called a proof of work. The nature and uses of message digests are counterintuitive at first, but these are indispensable ingredients in what makes Bitcoin possible. The top line here was an actual successful block header hash. It starts with a large number of zeros because a winning hash has to be below the value set in the current difficulty level. The only way to find a winner is to keep trying over and over again. The chances of a given miner finding such a hash for his own candidate block on any given try are minute. But somewhere in the network, one is found at a target average of about every 10 minutes. The winner collects the block reward, currently 25 new bitcoins, and any fees for included transactions. The block is already set up in advance so that these rewards are controlled by the winning miner's own unique mining address. This is possible because he already included it in his candidate block before it became a winner. A miner can only spend rewards from blocks that actually become part of the main chain because only those blocks can be referenced in future transactions. This design fully specifies the initial control of all first appropriations of new bitcoins. Exactly who wins each next block is random. To raise the probability of winning, a miner can only try to contribute a greater share of the current total network capacity in competition with all of the others trying to do the same thing. As we saw with the Rothbard quote, a completely different hash comes out with each attempt, even after the slightest change to the message. This is why the protocol includes a place for a number that is started at zero and changed by one for each new hash try. This generates a completely different hash each time in search of a winner. Here, it looks like this miner found a winning hash after about 3.2 billion tries. Finding a hash under the difficulty level is extremely unlikely, but verifying afterwards that one has been found is trivial. The rest of the miners do so and then move right along. They use the newly discovered hash of the previous block header as one of the inputs for their next crop of block candidates, and the race continues based on the remaining pool of unconfirmed transactions. The Bitcoin mining network recently hit 10 petahashes per second and is rising at a logarithmic pace. This means that about 10 quadrillion hashes were being tried across the network every second. This is the world's most powerful distributed computing network by far. Block rewards and transaction fees help promote the production and maintenance of this entire network in a fully decentralized way. Since block generation is random and distributed on average in proportion to hashing power contribution, it helps incentivize all contributors all the time. Most miners participate in cooperative mining pools so that at least some rewards arrive on a fairly regular basis. In this way, the network is entirely self-financed by participants from the beginning indefinitely into the future. Early on, new coin rewards are larger and transaction fee revenue smaller. Finally, only transaction fee revenue is to remain, but in between, a long and gradual transition is built in. If Bitcoin does remain successful over the longer term, by the time transaction fee revenue predominates, there would likely be many orders of magnitude more transactions per block by which to multiply the average competitive fee per transaction. 
This has been a summary look at a few of the key technical elements of Bitcoin. Hashing algorithms and digital signatures are especially counterintuitive and relatively new inventions, but knowing what they make possible is essential for understanding how Bitcoin works. Each of Bitcoin's major elements contribute to the central functions of verification, unforgeable record keeping, and fraud prevention. These functions sound about as far from the systematic deceptions of a Ponzi scheme as it is possible to get. In Part 3, we will build on the foundations in Parts 1 and 2 to examine Bitcoin from the point of view of monetary theory, mainly economic theory, but also a few legal theory issues.